Okay, hi. Welcome back. You are watching Drinking About Birds. I am Zach. I'm sure this show requires no introduction at this point. Uh, today we're going to be talking about ducks. We have this Merlot from Duckhorn, which is a producer out of California, and I'm kind of excited to talk about ducks. A little nervous because I don't know that much about them, um, but they're not like the birds that we've talked about so far in a number of ways, and they're pretty interesting. So ducks are part of the order Anseriformes. They are in the family Anatidae, which is pretty much synonymous with the uh, colloquial term waterfowl. So this encompasses ducks, geese, and swans. Uh, and they share a number of uh, anatomical characteristics. They have webbed feet. They have kind of spatulate bills with serrations along the edges called lamellae that some of them use for filter feeding. And they have a general dependence on water for their lifestyle. And much as the birds that we talked about previously have been dependent on kind of trees or tall structures for feeding, for protection from predators, for nesting sites, water kind of fulfills that role for the waterfowl. And this is a group that split off from the rest of bird kind about 70 million years ago. They're in a very ancient lineage, and this was in the late Cretaceous prior to the extinction event that wiped out the non-avian dinosaurs. And so what that means is that the most recent common ancestor of a duck and like a cardinal or a red-tailed hawk was walking the earth at the same time as like Triceratops, uh, and they actually predated uh, T. rex probably. So very ancient order, and back in the Cretaceous there were birds swimming and walking around that looked very much like the waterfowl that we know today. There was uh, a bird called Vague Avis. If you look at the skeletal structure of this bird, it's pretty clear that it was adapted to an aquatic lifestyle very similar to the waterfowl that we know today. So they've been just kind of in their own lineage and evolving in parallel with the rest of bird kind. Um, there are some other groups of birds that visually you would kind of think would belong to this group, but they don't. Um, things like grebes or coots or loons, uh, they have kind of the same half bird, half boat look to them. Uh, they share a dependence on water and this generally aquatic lifestyle, but they are part of uh, fairly unrelated groups of birds, and they've just evolved similar body forms, similar lifestyles uh, in response to similar ecological pressures. And that's an example of what we call convergent evolution. And this happens, or has happened, quite a lot in uh, the course of bird evolution. And it's one reason that bird taxonomy is so confusing, as I alluded to in the previous episode, because uh, once upon a time, bird taxonomy was really based on uh, morphological or anatomical similarities, so birds that kind of looked similar and had similar body structure, and now we have the technology to do really direct genetic comparisons, and that's a much more solid basis for figuring out which groups of birds are related to each other and how close they are. Uh, but now that we have those uh, genetic or mo uh, molecular techniques, a lot of the old taxonomy is sort of going out the window. So, um, strictly speaking, waterfowl belong to the Anatidae. So if it looks like a duck and walks like a duck and quacks like a duck, double check because it could just be convergent evolution. Uh, another characteristic that unites uh, some waterfowl is that they are actually sexually dimorphic for once, so yay! Um, and moreover, not only do males and females look uh, dissimilar, but the plumage actually changes with the season too. So this is a group of birds where males will commonly have actual breeding plumage that they molt into at the start of the breeding season and then drop uh, once the breeding is done. And molt is kind of a complicated subject unto itself, so I'm not going to touch on it too much here, but uh, I'll just say that uh, feathers are a characteristics that's shared by all birds. All birds have feathers, and feathers are made of keratin, similar to your hair or your fingernails. They are 
dead structures uh, once they have grown out of the skin and they wear out and so they have to periodically be replaced and sometimes that's a totally utilitarian thing but sometimes birds will actually change their appearance in the course of molting so uh, the purpose of that would be to either be more visually conspicuous for instance if you're going into the mating season and you want to be very flashy and snazzy in order to attract a mate or you might want to be less visually conspicuous for instance when the mating season is over and you don't want to be uh, quite so visible to predators anymore so uh, growing feathers or regrowing feathers is kind of an energetically intensive process and so most birds do it at least once a year um, some birds do it multiple times a year like waterfowl uh, and you also have to distinguish between flight feathers and body feathers so flight feathers have a pretty rigid structure and those are the feathers that extend beyond the body on the wings and the tail and that contribute directly to either lift or thrust and help the bird fly body feathers as the name suggests just cover the body and they provide coloration but also insulation uh, for birds that live in cold climates they provide waterproofing as in the case of ducks and other waterfowl the replacement is not such a dramatic process they pretty much fall out and then regrow flight feathers replacing those is a little more calculated because if you lose a set of flight feathers and you haven't regrown the new ones that's really going to impact your ability to fly and so birds have a particular schedule on which they replace their flight feathers. Some really large birds, like large raptors, uh, will actually not replace all of their flight feathers in a single year. Uh, it's a multi-year process. Waterfowl are pretty interesting in this respect. They actually drop all of their flight feathers at once, and so they're completely flightless for a period of several weeks. And they typically do that in the lead up to migration and so they regrow all their feathers and then they're going into migration with a nice fresh set and that leads us to a discussion of migration like a lot of waterfowl are in fact migratory which is another difference from the birds that we've talked about so far migration in birds is kind of a big deal for birds that migrate it's a huge part of their yearly routine so migration is movement that is seasonal so it occurs at a particular time of year it's directional so they know not necessarily where they're going but they know what direction they want to go and it's generally a movement between where they breed and when they spend their winters so breeding and wintering grounds is the terms for those and some birds migrate between the northern and southern hemispheres every year and so they'll be in the northern hemisphere when it's summer in the northern hemisphere and then in the fall they will migrate down to the southern hemisphere and the seasons between the northern and southern hemispheres are reversed and so essentially they wind up just living in perpetual summer other species are less dramatic about it and they migrate a few hundred or a few thousand kilometers north or south and so they're not changing hemispheres but in winter they're going down south it's kind of like your uh, retiree relatives who uh, go down to florida or arizona in the winter um, with birds it's less related to climate and weather per se than it is to food availability so when birds migrate uh, some birds waterfowl in particular they follow what are called flyways. These are natural migratory routes that are shaped by natural features of the landscape. And those include things like mountain ranges, oceans, the Great Lakes are a big influence on migration routes. <clears throat> and that sort of reflects the fact that this is already an energetically intensive process. And so if you're flying along and you come to like a mountain range, even if you're physically capable of flying up and over it, it makes a lot more sense to go around but when multiple features like this coincide in the landscape they have the effect of funneling birds uh, along particular routes so these are pathways that birds have followed for kind of generations upon generations now that humans are involved those flyways expose them to 
hunting. So this is the first bird that we talked about so far that you can legally hunt and eat. This wine producer is called decoy, and uh, if you're unfamiliar, a decoy is a an object that's created to be a facsimile of a living animal, such as a bird. And the purpose of this object is to lure migrating animals to a particular place where they will be uh, within range of hunters. So the idea is that you create this very convincing copy of an animal and put it out in full view and when birds are migrating, they will often make use of what are called stopover sites. Um, so they can't just do the entire journey in one go, it's too long. So they need places to rest and places to feed and replenish their energy reserves. And if they see another animal that looks a lot like them, the idea is that they will think, okay, this is probably a safe place, and they'll go down and then they will be within range of the hunter's guns. Decoys are ideally created to be very convincing copies. Um, I have one here that I found in Iowa some years ago. Uh, this is created to be, to look like a species of duck called a blue-winged teal. And this is just made of molded plastic. It's got this little uh, ridge along the bottom that will fill with water and act as ballast. But if you saw this floating on a pond, you'd think, yeah, that looks like a duck. And ideally a duck would think the same thing. But back before we had molded plastic, we had wood, and decoys used to be carved out of wood very painstakingly, and then they would be painted again painstakingly to look as much like the real animal as possible. And good decoys uh, have kind of come to be appreciated as a genre of folk art, um, and the ones by well-known carvers and uh, creators have become very collectible. And this particular one, I went on the website for Decoy, and they actually had the story behind this illustration. They said it was uh, painted by an artist named Michael Allard, painted from life from a specific decoy that was carved in the late 1930s by a, a pretty well-known producer. In keeping with the purpose of decoys, it is extremely recognizable for the species that it's supposed to be. This is uh, very clearly a northern pintail, which is Kind of a typical example of a uh, dabbling duck. So you have dabbling ducks and diving ducks. Dabbling ducks typically stay on the surface when they feed. They will kind of paddle around and use their head, they'll dunk their head down in the water to uh, eat food that is within reach from there. Um, if they want to get something that's a little further down, they will actually invert their entire body. That's called tipping. Uh, and they'll reach a little farther down in the water that way. But they don't really dive to any great extent. Whereas you also have diving ducks, which will dive straight down into the water. And diving ducks are more typically uh, piscivorous, so they're going after fish. Um, dabbling ducks will be going after aquatic vegetation and also little invertebrates uh, like snails or other mollusks or worms. Yeah, uh, northern pintails, they're about the same size as the mallard, which is probably the most familiar duck to most people. It's the most widespread duck on earth. But yeah, these guys are kind of snazzy. This is obviously meant to be a male uh, northern pintail in breeding plumage. So male ducks in breeding plumage are super easy. They're easy to pick out. All the field marks are super visible. They tend to be pretty large birds, and so it's really just kind of like a billboard in your face with all the field marks. Um, female ducks are trickier to tell apart, and the reason for that is that they're all basically some variation on brown and mottled. Male ducks, after the breeding season is over, they go into what's called eclipse plumage, where all of their flashy colors from the breeding plumage, uh, just they just drop that. It's uh, an extra molt, and they grow in a new coat of body feathers that are much more drab and subdued. If you don't have those pressures of having to be flashy to attract a mate, then obviously cryptic coloration is kind of the way to go. Northern pintails are a ground nesting species, as many ducks and other waterfowl are. Ground nesting is pretty much what it sounds like. The female kind of scrapes a shallow depression in the dirt 
and that's where she lays her eggs. And unlike birds that nest in trees or in you know rock cavities or burrows or whatever, there's no built-in protection from predators here. So any fox or raccoon or any land animal that wanders along just gets a free meal of eggs. If you're thinking it sounds risky, it definitely is. But ducks are also a, sp uh, a group of birds that have what's called precocial young. That's as opposed to altricial. Precocial means that when the eggs hatch, the little baby birds that come out of it are actually pretty highly developed already. And so they're able to stand up under their own power. They're able to ingest food and they're able to leave the nest within like hours. So the eggs are very, very exposed while they're in the nest, but the baby birds do not stay in the nest for long. And so it's kind of a trade-off. <clears throat> Once the baby birds leave the nest, then you get a little horde of ducklings following mom around for a period of weeks or months as they continue to develop. Um, she tries to lead them to you know, safe areas and uh, reliable food sources as best she can. They're still pretty exposed to predation. I mean, ducklings are kind of nature's chicken nuggets, but the risk is sort of distributed. So a predator might get one chick, but the rest of the brood is okay. I mean, it's kind of a brutal logic, but that's how nature operates. Baby ducks develop pretty fast once they leave the nest. Um, within a few weeks to a few months, they will be basically adult size. They will have an adult complement of uh, flight feathers, body feathers. Um, they're able to swim very soon after leaving the nest, so that gives them some pre uh, protection from predators. But when they hatch in spring and summer, they have a few months to grow and develop, and then it's time for them to migrate. So this a uh, massive journey of hundreds or thousands of miles uh, is undertaken by birds that are like six months old. So again, potentially pretty brutal and uh, migration is definitely risky. Young birds across the board tend to have pretty high mortality, but that's just the way of life that they have. To make matters worse, they have to contend with human hunters. Let me just get this out there. I don't hunt. I never have. Um, I'm not like morally opposed to hunting. I know a lot of people who hunt and who would probably take me hunting if I asked, um, but I just never have. And so a lot of my knowledge of hunting is necessarily secondhand. Um, so some of the things I am say might be hilariously wrong, but... Uh, that's just a typical episode in this series. So the history of hunting in the United States, hunting in the U.S. used to be almost completely unregulated. Uh, it was pretty much a free for all and it became commercialized in kind of the late 19th century. It got to the point where waterfowl were being just kind of slaughtered en masse and they would be sent off to meatpacking plants or sold for feathers and it got to the point where a lot of species populations were uh, threatened because of all this uh, commercial exploitation that was going on and so congress stepped in and enacted what is one of our first uh, conservation oriented laws which is the migratory bird treaty act of 1918 and this law is still on the books today um, it's called the Treaty Act because it is the domestic implementation of an international treaty that we signed with Canada uh, to protect wa uh, waterfowl and other bird life uh, that might migrate back and forth between the two countries. And in the intervening years, it's been expanded so that it now includes treaties with Mexico and Japan and Russia as well, which are mostly to control import and export of the species that are covered, but it applies to uh, over a thousand species now, almost 1,100 actually, and those species are any birds that uh, exist in the United States through natural, biological, or e ecological processes and are listed in the terms of these various treaties. 
what the Migratory Bird Treaty Act does basically is it prohibits the quote unquote take, which is uh, killing or harvesting of any bird that's covered under the treaty or under the act without the prior authorization of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. <clears throat> and that prior authorization clause gives them a ton of power to regulate when and where and how uh, hunting can take place. The list of species that are actively hunted today is about 60. Um, Northern pintails are definitely among them. Yeah, it's a very broad law, and uh, as a result of that prior authorization clause, um, waterfowl hunting is very heavily regulated at both the state and federal level. So um, the Secretary of the Interior um, sets the season during which hunting can take place. That's generally in late fall to early like January, and that's time to coincide with migration. And uh, there's all sorts of specific techniques and practices that are prohibited by law. Stuff that's prohibited is generally either to protect populations of species that are subject to hunting, or it's to make the practice of hunting more sportsmanlike, so to prevent uh, unnecessary cruelty or just to give the species that are hunted kind of more of a sporting chance. Again, I don't have a lot of first-hand knowledge of hunting, but um, we can appreciate that it's a bit more regulated nowadays, and so populations of these species will persist for future generations to enjoy. The wine this time, uh, I don't have that much to say about it, honestly. Um, this producer is part of the expansive Duckhorn portfolio, which includes a bunch of different producers and labels. Um, Duckhorn is kind of a big deal. They make a lot of very well-regarded and quite expensive wines. The name is just the founder's name was Duckhorn, but they've taken that and kind of run with it, and now they have this waterfowl theme running across a bunch of the di uh, different wines in their portfolio, which is just catnip for me. Um, so this one has a Northern Pintail, their flagship label wine has a mallard on it. Um, they have one called Canvasback that's produced in Washington. They have Goldeneye, which apart from being a 90s Bond film that totally holds up, is also a species of diving duck. There are several species actually. They have one that's actually called Migration. They have one called Paradux. It's just, yeah. They've gone nuts with the waterfowl theme. I love it. Yeah. This is a it's called a second wine, so it's wine that is produced sort of under the auspices of a producer, but it's separate from their flagship, their main line of wines, and it's produced with grapes that were not included in the making of their flagship wines. And so it is necessarily sort of lesser in quality as judged by their winemakers, but it can still be pretty good. This is a very modestly priced bottle. And like I said, I don't have a ton to say about it. Well, that's all the time we have for this week. My name is Zach. This has been Drinking About Birds, and uh, hope to see you next time.